Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Pain, Pleasure and My Will Q&A presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Pain, Pleasure and My Will. Recorded on 11th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Oh, my darling friends. <laughs> You're pretty challenged today. <laughs> yep. Yeah, myself and Corny were just commenting about the difference uh, on this day for both groups. And your group, very heavy today. Very heavy today. And, um, and I, I feel a lot of it's got to do with this sort of relationship with pain that you have, actually. It's like the feeling inside of the majority of you is that you just want to prevent pain at all costs. And you were hoping that divine truth would be the way that you could event, prevent pain. That's what you were hoping. I can't remember that I've ever suggested that to you. I have said, I have said that you, once you're at one with God, you won't feel pain. But I haven't suggested that you're going to be able to prevent pain through the process of becoming at one with God. In fact, I've suggested quite the opposite, if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's get started on the question and Q&A on this subject. Pain, pleasure and my will, Q&A. So, Felix, you want to start first? Uh, Mr. Felix. Sorry, sorry. Microphone man. Um, oh. <clears throat> um, just in challenging my addictions, I, I kind of got the, came up with a guess and it seemed like a, a reasonable one. Yeah. That um, for me to, like, so okay, I challenge my addictions and then there's not much pleasure left. <laughs> yep. Um, but I kind of got the, came to the conclusion that, and it seemed to make sense because I'd be trying to engage my will to love a bit, that... Uh, in that process, the almost the only source of pleasure I'd have is is me growing, making a attempt to grow my will. Is that correct? It seems so. Uh, I don't feel so. No, I, I feel like well, for a start, um, you'll get the pleasure of knowing that you're now engaging your will in a yeah. more positive direction. So that there's pleasure that comes from that. But there's also the pleasure of things like, uh, for, for example, um, ha now you know you have some courage, whereas you didn't have that before. Yeah. Now you know you're not guided so much by pain anymore. Now, so your decisions are being made by different things, so that causes pleasure. You now know that you have more of an opportunity to have different things occur, positive in your life, you know, with surrounding soulmate issues and other things mm. like that. So that's going to cause you pleasure. You, you also be able to feel more of God. So, so that means that in that place you, you can start to feel God's love entering you. So that's going to cause pleasure. So th there's a whole heap of pleasures that begin to happen as soon as mm. you address the issue. I feel, though, that for the majority of us, our addictions are so entrenched and very, very strong that we, we first have to go through what, what feels like a lot of pain to give yeah. them up. Yep. And, that, and that does cause us to not be very sensitive to the pleasures that we're getting at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that there's, a, there's a reason for that, and that is inside of our soul, uh, when we process emotion, if this is a graph and this is, this is intensity of emotion, right? And it happens that this much emotion is... is sort of a painful emotion of giving up the addiction yeah. and you're getting this much pleasure right, from, from the different results of starting to do that, yeah. then, then obviously the thing you're more sensitive to yeah. is the greater feeling, which is the pain. So, so it's often only the case when the two start to equalise or, or the pain is similar level to the pleasure that you start recognising the, the pleasures that you're receiving from the choices you're making. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because no, I, I noticed if I do an experiment and you know, even a, in a few hours of challenging addiction and really being sincere, I felt even in a few hours I'm like, oh, 
That was a good choice, actually. Yeah, yeah. and you, you start also yeah. getting the pleasure of the fact that not only do you have courage, but now you, you start feeling like, hang on a sec, other people and other things are not determining my life anymore. It's me determining my life. Yeah, I'm starting to get that. Yeah, yeah and that feels it's really good, good yeah. eh? It's like, yeah. it's like, oh, it's like, not, you know, realising in that moment that actually the choices you're making will change your life. And it's not... See, see most people on Earth sort of have almost this, uh, this terrible feeling that everything's out of their control. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why they're madly going around trying to get control of everything. And, and then when you realise you start processing through a, f a bit of your pain, you start realising, oh, the way to control is actually to reduce all of your pain. Right to, to actually feel it, process through it and release it and to not feed your addictions anymore, not do the sins anymore, right? not do all of those things. That's the way to actually get control of your life. And once you start realising that, you do feel a lot more strongly in control of your life. And that's a subsequent side benefit of actually doing things God's way. Mm. You, you're not struggling to get control anymore. You automatically have some control now, yeah. which is wonderful. Uh, I, I was, just when I was starting to experiment, I was wondering how long before this will feel like a bit better. <laughs> and it was actually not even starting a little bit. Yeah, sometimes right, it can so be the same know. day. Yeah. <laughs> you know I what I mean? I'm surprised, yeah. Yeah. No, thank, you, thank you. Yeah, same day oftentimes. But yeah, th th there is this issue of initially when we begin, we've got a lot of pain to feel the intensity of the pain. Um, you know, sometimes overwhelms us and, and so we don't actually see the pleasures developing until they're sort of almost on top of us and then we go, oh, well, you know, this has changed and that's changed and, and you start measuring it that way. Who did we have next? Oh, I didn't choose anybody next. Chris, down here, thanks. Um, I was going to ask you about what you talked to me yesterday about, about like the blocks to, to your grief. Um, and I was just going to ask you, like, when you were really blocked to your grief, like in earlier days, um, and you felt all that pain underneath the surface, and it's just like in your head, it's in your heart, your heart's been ripped out. Were those the times you went for your blocks, or did you just sort of just make notes of things and... Honestly, the biggest thing that helped me the most, I think, was my willingness to surrender, to actually stop fighting, stop fighting, you know, because it, it's the fighting the emotions and fighting the consciousness of pain and fighting what's going on that causes a lot of problems. And, and you know, I wouldn't recommend this for you, but, but what happened to me was I lost everything. And once I lost everything, there was nothing to protect anymore. There was nothing to fight for anymore. And that just caused me to surrender to what was really going on. So that's what helped me. Um, I don't know if that's a thing I'd recommend for you to do. <laughs> but, but it did help me greatly because I, I learned in that moment to surrender. And, and now surrender to me is quite a simple process. Unless I've got a lot of projections or whatever. It's a simple process. So it's about allowing the surrender which is which is really about allowing yourself to be humble to to the process and um and I, I don't know i just feel like that again is a aspiration that you can develop until the point that you do surrender um and i feel like it, it, remember we talked about your family based issues yesterday chris and and or oh, the day before it was Yep. And, um, and I mentioned to you, you know, you talked about how angry you felt about how your family's treating you. And I said to you, well, that's because you haven't surrendered to the sadness, right? You're not allowing yourself to surrender to the sadness of how they make you feel about yourself and so forth. So that tells you, you you're still fighting. Does that make sense? You're still fighting the process. And the law of compensation is your only chance when you're fighting a process, you know? The law, of con con the, the law is designed to grind you into submission. That's, that's what it feels like sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. how the law is designed. It's sometimes purposeful. I just let it grind me and I'm like, all right, what now? I'm just being ground into powder. Yeah, but, but the key is to, the, to actually surrender to the process of the emotion. And, because then, then you're more engaging. You see, most people don't realise, but actually 
many of the unloving feelings we have towards ourselves we have to repent about right we we, we hold on to them for dear life you know like many of us are addicted to holding on to the concept that we're not worth much you know you, you, can you see there's many motivational reasons for doing it one of the motivations is then we don't ever have to be much or do anything yeah or do anything we can we, we can sit back and relax and not do anything yeah. under those circumstances once we believe we're worth something then then it would motivate us into a different form of action so 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 we're often not repentant about love of self and we're not repentant about love of others and we're definitely not repentant about love of God in a lot of cases so so repentance would cause a surrender on those issues right and what I've noticed is if I can surrender then things go much better for me than if I don't surrender if I fight that's what being humble is about really I just have a cough so being humble you is about surrendering to the actual emotion mm. so that's what I'd recommend you focus your attention on getting the aspiration to surrender to the grief rather than fighting the grief and anger is proof that you fight yeah, grief. because I guess sometimes I don't know what I do but I just fight it and then sometimes I can drop into it and it's like fuck this is what I'm this is it, eh? This feels good. Yeah, it does feel good. And yeah. then you hit you, the block and all of a sudden it's bam, straight away again with the bat. Just like, I guess it feels like spirits, family, just like whoosh, claws come out again and you're just like, oh, shit. Yeah. A lot of times we uh, <clears throat> continue fighting because of our belief system. So we do have to deconstruct a lot of our false beliefs that cause us to revert back to a fight again, for sure. Cool, mm. thanks, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, sorry, come across to Amber, thanks. <clears throat> um, on the topic of pleasure, mm -hmm. what will optimal physical pleasure and health look like from God's perspective? Like, I know that um, diseases will disappear and sickness, mm -hmm. but um, what exciting physical changes that we have never seen before will we be seeing? From God's perspective, um, I'd prefer to probably demonstrate them than to talk about them, if I could. Um, when I say demonstrate them, I'm, that's what we're hoping to achieve. Myself and Mary through this process, and Corny's beginning the process too, so he's hoping to achieve that too. But but because um, talking about them is highly underrated. <laughs> Um, because you can talk about all of these different things but you've got to ask yourself what, what is it I'm trying to achieve when I'm talking about them and for yourself the, there's the addiction of wanting to hear some good news so that you can avoid the bad news <laughs> do, you, do you see that yeah yeah so that that's what's motivating the question and and um, I see this happening all the time where where sort of like one of the problems that you've faced in the last eight to ten years of listening to me many of you is that you've used me for your inspiration without willing being willing to develop any aspiration in other words you you come to get inspired it lasts how long on the average <laughs> maybe a few days maybe a few weeks for some of you maybe even a few months after we've had a session might last a few months even and what I noticed when I was doing the sessions regularly it probably lasted more than not much more than a day or or less um, often you would leave the uh, seminar and you know by the time the next week came around you were back to the original state you're in before I met you and before the first seminar I gave and this uh, indicates to me that that you're heavily reliant on someone else providing your inspiration and my feeling about that is that the more I provide your inspiration the more I'm just feeding an addiction you see it's sort of like just the feeding the addiction to feel good for a momentarily rather than having to do the actual sincere soul-based work that will help you work through these issues permanently and it's also quite draining for me phys physically at times just having to give out all this energy to inspire you only to find that next week 
very few of you have exercised any aspiration and so you're back to where you were before type of thing. And that's not what I want to keep doing here. What, what I want to do is, is help you see that, the, and this is the point of our session this week really, is to help you see how important it is for you to make some of your own choices here, make some of your own decisions, to motivate yourself, to learn how to motivate yourself. We've become, particularly in the Western world, we've become a society reliant upon other people to provide everything for us, haven't we? Like, in particular, we're, we're very reliant on government to fix our problems. We, we don't see our own ability to fix our problems, our own ability to create a job. We're, we're waiting for the government to create a job for us. We're waiting for the government to fix up our health problems for us. We're waiting for the government to do all of these different things. And if it's not the government, it's family. And if it's not family, it's our friends. And if it's not our friends, then it's somebody, some guru who comes along. With, you know, he's got to do it for us. And, and none of that works. And it's never going to work. It has to come from within oneself. Now, it's a delicate bal balancing act for me sometimes, I inspiring you, while at the same time not feeding your addiction to be inspired. <laughs> Does that make sense? And this is what I'm try we're trying to do in these presentations, is to stop the process of feeding the addiction to be inspired and to help you see that actually this gets down to your own decisions. And, and if you embrace the process that God's made, God's made this beautiful process for you. And if you embrace this process, you will become inspired naturally through that process. You will become inspired. Now, the main reason why the majority of you are not inspired at, uh, even at this point is because of this pain issue. Like, you are adverse to even discussing it, let alone feeling it. You know, whenever I discuss anything, what you, anything that you believe is negative, and pain, anything related to a discussion with pain is negative for many of you, you're instantly shutting down. And I'm going, well, hang on a sec here. Let's face it. If you could have no pain in your life, surely you would like that. Yeah. And surely feeling pain for a short period of time is worth in the end, not having any pain, surely. But n very few of you have this long-term view. Y you are into instant satisfaction. Uh, and this is a problem that I see. It's like your problems weren't created instantly. They were created over many years of others and yourselves making choices out of harmony with love. You cannot hope to, to bear the consequences of such decisions in one moment. You can't. You can't hope that it's all going to be rubbed out in one instant. Because if it was, you would never learn anything. You'd never learn what created all these problems. You'd never learn the re re relationship between cause and effect. You'd never learn what caused your pain and how you can fix it if you do it that way. So I sort of see this desire for instant solution and for instant resolution of your pain actually is being very counterproductive to your progress and, and future. And by the way, God does too. God feels it is too. That's why God never created an instant magical wand that, where you could just you say, God, could you wave your magical wand? And God goes, yes, yes. Amber, I will wave my magical wand for you and everything will be hunky-dory, right? Everything will be fine. And, and God's not going to do that because the reality is we wave the wand of, wand of sin for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. And if it could just be magically waved away in a moment, then we would come to believe that we could just go and wave a wand of sin again for years and years and years and it would just get waved away in a moment when I wanted it waved away. And that's not how it works. And it's also not real to expect that, really, is it? Like, can you really say, can you really say that if we've, wa if we've caused sin over many years, and in, and in the human society's case, many millennia, we can't expect that it's all just going to disappear by us all just having some magical process. 
Like, we need to understand the penalty of sin. <laughs> and once we understand that, we will never engage sin again. You see, we don't want it so that God has to wave his wand for you and then you all become sinless straight away. And so you might tell other people, oh, it's wonderful being sinless, you know, it's this and that, and it's just screwed, and I have all of these lovely experiences as a result. But by the time you're dead and the next generation comes along, many of them will still want to sin because they haven't learnt the lesson of what creates sin and the problems of creating sin. Because it's just get magical, magically wiped away all the time. So no, and also, not, notwithstanding the fact that God honours our will, the reality is mankind are using their will to sin, and then they want God to come and remove the effects. And and like I said at the beginning of this session, these sessions, God's not going to remove the effect of something He did not create. He's not. We're going to have to do that. So we have to take that action. Um, exactly <coughs> how many years ago was it when Adam and Eve were created? Like how many years are we... Yeah, around 150,000. 150,000 years of sin pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It's worked pretty well, huh? No. No. This is the thing we have to come to realise collectively. It hasn't worked. I'm not impressed. No, <laughs> no. But see, But see, you say that because of the effect that other people's sin has had on you. But you do not see the effect that your sin has on other people. So while you say you're not impressed, you're really just not impressed with other people's sin. You're fully impressed with your own. And this is a problem, is that, is that we need to change that so that we see the relationship. Well, actually, I'm in the same position as a modern man. I'm, I'm, I'm affecting other people by the choices I'm making. I'm affecting my soulmate, the other half of me. I'm affecting my children, the next generation. My, all my choices are exactly the same choices that they made then. Right? We need to see that. We need to see and understand that. So, so what I see many of you doing is saying, you, you're there blaming a man and a man and, and all these generations of people who have sinned, and yet when it comes to yourselves, you think you're innocent. <laughs> and you're not. No one who's ever lived on this planet is innocent. We've all got sin that we need to address, and we've all created these problems and we all need to learn how to address them and if we learn how to address them properly we will change and not only will we change eventually the world will that's how it will change now God's love has a large effect on rubbing out the effect of sin but but as I'm saying to you you have to be able to feel God's love for it to enter you and you have to not be blocked to it entering you if you want this education, you've got to at least get rid of the reasons why you're stopping God's love from entering you, why you're stopping God's truth from entering you. And remember, we talked about this all week, how love and truth are joined at the hip, and most of you want love, but you don't want any truth. So these are all things that need to be addressed. And, and the reality is, uh, like, you can walk out of this feeling depressed, or you could walk out of this feeling like, wow, I now know what I need to do. You could. That's your choice too, isn't it? How you walk away from these sessions will completely be dependent upon your outlook with regard to things. It will completely depend upon how you're going to exercise your will. Hmm. Uh, if we go, Makala, up the back, thanks. Um, I recognise that. It a lot of my pain comes from my mum's, or my avoidance of pain, comes from my mum's desperate desire to avoid her pain, as well as my own doing. But So how do I approach that element of it and feeling about that? Well, firstly, Michaela, that's not true. Okay. Okay, so we need to see where all, most of our pain comes from. Most of our pain from my, my pain comes from my personal choice. <laughs> That's where the majority of my pain comes from. No other source. Right? So that's number one. <coughs> now, in your case, you've got a personal choice 
to avo avoid feeling some of your mum's projections at you, right? Why is that? Can you feel about why that is? Uh, why do you go along with mum? Because she'll freeze me out or not love me if I, if I don't follow what she's doing. Yes. So she already doesn't love you and you're not coming to terms with that emotionally. You're not allowing yourself to feel the pain of the fact that she doesn't love you. And that's your personal choice, that's not her choice. You're wanting her to change first. You understand? You want her to love you and so you're doing everything you possibly can to get her to love you first. Right? But, but the personal choice you're making is waiting for another person to remove your sin. Right? And your sin is not choosing to love yourself and remove yourself from a person who doesn't love you. And you obviously have investments as to the reason why you want that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, so this is the thing. We need to see our decisions as our personal choice. Our pain in our life is the result of our personal choice. It's just not always in the way we imagine it is. So, so in your case, you might have thought, well, you know, mum's doing this and mum's doing that and mum's doing this and that's what's causing me pain. And I'm suggesting to you, no, mum's doing all those things and that is her choice. You not choosing to remove yourself from her is what's causing your pain. If it, you feeling like you need her for whatever it is that you need her for. And particularly when you've got a child and you, you feel alone, alone with a child and so forth, you think you need your mum and you think, you know what I mean? There's a whole th heap of things you think you need that you won't be able to cope with without. And so we then compromise ourselves, compromise love of self, and a lot of personal pain is the result of my personal choice to compromise love of self. And that's the source of a lot of your pain. Your willingness to compromise your love of self. That make sense? So, so remember, a few days ago we mentioned that there's three primary loves that we need to work out to get in harmony with, with our will. The first one was our love of God, the second one was the love of self, and the third one was the love of others, right? That's the three primary loves, right? Now, can you see you're, you're sacrificing yourself and you don't see it as a sin. You sort of see it as, you know, mum's sin. Mum's wanting you to sacrifice yourself and I agree she does but you sort of see it as her sin causing your pain. And I'm saying, no, no, it's your sin to sacrifice yourself that's causing your pain. Does that make sense? You could choose to not sacrifice yourself, and even though mum wants you to, you don't do it. And under those, those situations, you won't have that same pain anymore. You follow? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So, so we've got to see that our pain... like. Many of you have this belief that with regard to pain that God's sort of a bit unfair. Like somebody else does something wrong and you feel pain as a result of it is the way you see it. Right? Now to me, if that were actually true, and it's definitely not true, but if that were actually true, that means that God would be very unfair. Why, 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 would, like, why would God do such a thing? Like, I, I don't know, like would you do such a thing? Like if, if, I went and did, if I went and punched Corny in the nose and then you felt pain because of it, <laughs> would that be <laughs> very fair? Right? It wouldn't be, would it? So, so obviously we've got to get down to this uh, idea or concept which is actually true and that is that the pain that I personally experience is a direct result of the choices that I am personally making. So, so that's called responsibility. The pain that I am personally experiencing is a direct result of the choices I am personally making. Right? And, I, and I've had to come to terms with that myself because it, 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 initially everything inside of you rebels against that fact. It does. It goes, but what about when this person does that to me? And what about when that person does this to me? And so forth. And, but once you work your way through it all emotionally, you get to the stage where you realise, actually... I can either accept this treatment or 
or not accept it. I have the choice, my, my will has, I have the choice with my will as to what I accept and what I process and what I don't. I've got full control over what I do, not, not control over anybody else. And, and you also come to see that God has created this beautiful system where, where if I'm in pain, it's the, it's the direct result of my personal choice. So that's my feedback mechanism. I'm in pain. I must be out of harmony to love, not somebody else. You follow? So when, when I feel my, back, my lower back pain, I'm not going, it's all your fault, even though I'm standing up in front of you for hours, and it's the only time I feel back pain is when I'm standing up in front of you as a group. I'm not going, it's all your fault. I'm going, oh, hang on a sec, there's something in this interaction with the group that causes this. Do you follow? There's got to be there's something my, my something in my choice that causes this. I need to examine what that is for myself. What what it is? It's obviously a love of self issue, right? So I've got to because it's lower back, second shower, or you know you can go through all the theory if you want, but I can feel it, it obviously is. So I've got to feel what it is. And what do I primarily feel from the group? This group. Well, I primarily feel sort of disbelief a lot of the times, uh, desire to not agree, a lack of trust, quite a lot of other issues, right, which I feel from the group. And I go, okay, so, so those emotions projected at me cause my back to react the way they do. So, so why is that? What choices am I making as a result of that? Of those projections? What, what, because my pain is my pain. It's caused by what I'm doing not by what you're doing, it's caused by what I'm doing. The same applies to you. If you have pain, it's caused by what you're doing. Now, the world is way out of harmony with love of self. Right? We, we don't know how to love ourselves very much at all. We believe sacrifice is love. Sacrifice of self, primarily. I used to be really, really bad with it. Like. Before I was 33, I'd work myself in the ground for other people. I, I was a minister of religion that didn't get paid. <laughs> so I, so I, everything I did was voluntarily, very voluntarily. I worked three, like two to five days a week, and then on top of that I did at least the same amount of time, more than 40 hours a week, doing the religious stuff for other people. Right? And I ran myself right into the ground. Physically, I was, you know, in my 30s and I was a bit of a wreck, right? Not a bit of a wreck. I was getting sick every month. You know, for, I'd be sick every month for a week solid, in bed, sick for a month, every month for one week, without fail. <laughs> uh, body's trying to tell me you're doing too much, you're not looking after yourself, not loving yourself. <laughs> And I'm just ignoring it and ignoring it and ignoring it because I just feel like I have to do things for other people all the time, right? So I, it's my choice. I'm, I'm choosing that. That's why it's happening. I need to see it as my choice, you see? So what I'd recommend for yourself, Michaela, is to see the personal choice to not love yourself and to see that your mum wants you to make that choice and you feel like you have to to get more love from her. And I would suggest to you that actually a person who wants you to make the choice to not love yourself already doesn't love you. And, and you just don't want to come to terms with the fact she doesn't. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, come down to Ivana and then cross to Jada. Um, so about six months ago you, were, uh, you mentioned to Justin that um, his... Uh, if I can explain, Justin oh, being sorry, your... my partner. <laughs> other half. <laughs> sort of. Well, I haven't worked <laughs> Experimental out, so. other half, should we call him that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you explained to Justin that when we got together, his asthma and stuff came back mm -hmm. and that it was um, because of a projection that I was... that I am projecting towards him. Like wanting to shut down his grief. You know, it's not it's not your your projection at him. It's his response to your projection. Okay, at him. yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yep. So, with you just mentioning before that, 
um, you saying that there was a choice that you were, I think you said, choice that you were making as a result of our projections towards mm. you yeah. that create pain. So that's the same. Yeah, it's the same for him. Exactly yep. so. Yeah. Yep. On one hand, before what was happening is he, he, uh, he was doing all this stuff pandering to women and then he's decided after that that he shouldn't do that so he stopped doing that but he hasn't dealt with that emotionally and then he went to this other side of like feeling like you should give him some love and yep. and so forth and then when you didn't do that he feels like the same level of grief it's the same emotion undealt with okay but just he was just, just choosing different projections a different, yeah okay and and his unwillingness to feel his his physical response is caused by his emotional shutdown and that's his choice. So he's making a choice. Okay. Yep. yep. Cool. Yep. But that doesn't justify projecting at him, does it? Maybe. No. If you want to put it like that, just for a second. What I've just said doesn't justify the fact that you should still project an unloving emotion at him. Yeah, well, I didn't even realise that that's what I was doing. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. Um, and just with you mentioning about my um, safety and security issues and... Yeah, I didn't realise that's, that's what I was doing. So yeah. it, it's been helpful. Um, you want the man to make you feel safe and secure and, and particularly uh, economically. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I've started getting into some anger about that, which has sort of changed things a little bit, not permanently, because I haven't... No, because the anger is not the surrender. It's the, it's the rebellion against the surrender. Yeah. That's yep. why there will be very little change. It will help you, but you need to go further and get into the fear and the Yeah, and the well, grief. I think because I, I was like raging in my car for ages. I was like, okay, AJ's <laughs> told me a pretty big <laughs> thing, like that my safety and security issue is like a global issue. And I'm like, oh, all right, well, I should really get into that then. Like, cause I, like, Can you see like, willpower though versus oh. will there? Like. Because yeah. the feeling in the will is, no, I don't want to go there. Yeah. So you'd be better off finding the aspiration to go there inside of your will rather than using your willpower to do it. Yeah, I just feel terrified, really. Like yeah, so, so let yourself feel that emotion. That, that's the better emotion to feel. The reality is that women feel terrified when they don't generally have a man around to provide physical safety and security or... or economic safety and security and there's a long history on the in the world why because there's been a history of you know women getting raped and harmed and abused by because they don't have a man to protect them from from those particular things from occurring and this is this is a terrible amount of terror inside of most women that most women are in complete denial of and they don't want to even accept and then as a result of that they project all this stuff at the man they anger at the man you should pull you know you should do these things for me yeah mm. yeah thank you so let yourself feel that emotion that's the emotion to focus on yep uh, we were up to jada yep. yep thanks um you said to me at the last assistant group um that I had a highly developed will for seeking pleasure. Yep. Which I understood as, um, well, and as my You understand better of, what I'm my saying My definition now? of pleasure, not, obviously not God's definition. Yeah, but, um, exactly. Um, so my version of pleasure at the moment is avoiding pain. Uh, not just that. Your version of pleasure is getting your addictions met. That's okay. your version of pleasure. Yep. Yep. So it's not just avoiding pain, just it's me. seeking out what you believe to be pleasurable things just in order to get your addictions met because, because the way you see it is your addictions bring you pleasure. Yep. Satisfying them brings you pleasure. Yep. yep. And so the only way to overcome that is to um, use my will to feel the pain? No, no. Like at some point you've got to see, is it really pleasure that you're getting? Like, is it really? Like, at some, you've got to get to the truth at some point, right? Yeah. Are you re do you really have such a life of pleasure? Like, like, can you see yourself being 80 years old, just for a moment, and yeah. you're living exactly as you're living now, but you no longer have mummy? Imagine what your life is going to be. So you're not with a woman. You're not, you're not with a partner. You're living alone. Mm -hmm. Mummy's not cooking or cleaning or doing the washing and ironing or whatever else for you, mm -hmm. right? 
you're living completely alone. There's no emotional addictions you can get met from her anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no woman in her right mind who wants to live with you. Right, because you, cause you generally treat women badly, sexually and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So there's no woman in her right mind living with you. And, and do you think that's going to be a happy life? No. No? So if that's where it's headed, mm -hmm. then, then what's going to cause you to be motivated to actually develop an aspiration to change? You, you remember um, some time ago, I don't know if you've actually heard this channeling, Jada, but I gave, there was, Mary and I did a channeling with a guy who actually comes to the groups and influences many of you to sin. You remember Anthony. him? Anthony, yeah. Yeah, yep. Remember that? Yep. And remember, in order to get him to pause, I had to actually take him, ask some of our spirit friends to take him, to the hells, where a guy who had done what he's doing had done it for many years and what he ended up like. You remember? Mm -hmm. And remember what the guy had ended up like? He'd gone bonkers, right? Like, yep. like, like ha ha diseased, basically, of the mind in the spirit world, just roaming around. You know, he, he was just going around in circles, muttering to himself. He couldn't do anything else. That's all he was doing. And he'd been doing that for years and years and years. Right? That, that was the result of Anthony's future. That's the future result of Anthony's current behaviour. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And what did that do for Anthony? You remember? You remember it made him sort of like... Before then he was very argumentative, wasn't he? He wanted to attack me, wanted to abuse me a bit. Yep. He wanted to laugh at all of you guys who were easily influenced and everything. And he felt he was doing the right thing. You wanted it, he wanted it. It was all good. Right, so he didn't really see any sin in anything he was doing, did he? Would, would, actually, would I have been one of the people? Sorry, would I have been one of the people that he influenced? Because of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. which is the reason why I bring up the issue. Mm -hmm. But 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 the the reality is he, he couldn't see anything he was doing as being wrong because he was meeting your addictions, right? He was meeting your addictions, so he feels everything's good. Everything's good for you. Everything's good for both of us. But. When I took him to see the true results of where he was headed, mm -hmm. what happened then? I actually can't remember. Mm, interesting, yeah. huh? Mm. Anybody else remember? Um, if we just go across to Paul on the other side with the other mic. Yep. Oh, yeah, he was pretty shocked and he, he just thought, oh, I don't want to be like that. I can't keep that up if that's going to happen. Yeah, and it and caused him to pause, didn't it? It caused him to go, Whoa, it's like, you're, so you're telling me that that's where I'm going to end up? And I said, yep. <laughs> and, and he's going, oh, okay. So now, now he's going, okay, there's a future event there that I don't know if I want that future event. So what am I going to do now to change my way of life, my path, if you like? Right? And this is what I'm suggesting to you, Jada. You need to examine... Not just the, the instant pleasure that you receive by getting your addictions met, but you need to examine the future long-term course if you keep doing the same thing and where it's going to end up. Right? You need to allow yourself to truthfully examine that because it's quite easy to see where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. and, and it could end up in a lot more serious places than you even think. You could end up with very severe venereal diseases. You could end up with all sorts of problems that could actually threaten your life if you continue on the current course of action. You follow? Yeah. So, so, so you're just measuring the instant gratification of meeting the addiction without considering... See, see a person who's sane considers also the long-term effects of, some, of the behaviour, not just the instant gratification portion of the behaviour. You follow me? Yeah. Now... If you're truly sane, this is what you'll do. You'll consider the long-term effects of a course of action and then you'll ask yourself, well, do I want the outcome or do I want the results of that long-term effect? And if you're really wise, you, you would, you would re-look at your current behaviour, seeing that that would be the outcome in the long term. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So what I'm suggesting with pleasure versus pain is, is because of the instant gratification issue, we forget to measure uh, 
over time, you know? So that, if that's a graph of time, and this is a graph of years, well, what am I going to end up one with, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, you know, right up to sort of near the end of my life? What am I going to end up with if I consider, if I can continue to do the same thing? You're going to get to a stage where your body isn't attractive anymore. So no woman in her right mind will want to sleep with you, mm -hmm. right? The only way you're going to get sexual gratification then is to go more to prostitutes, mm -hmm. right? in order to get sexual gratification. That's the only way you're going to do it. Because um, you're probably not going to get much after that. Right? The problem with that is, that is that, of course, that exposes you to all sorts of issues, besides it being numbing emotionally and, and terrible for your personal happiness, and also harming those particular women in the process or contributing to their harm. Uh, it's also causing a lot of further damage to yourself and your soul. And you're also not considering this part of your life. The big D. <laughs> Death. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen after the big D? Where you're going to end up? Because if you were considered that, you definitely wouldn't engage your current behaviour at all. So what I would do there is I'd look at people, you know, try to find out from people in the spirit world who have actually engaged in, and they're in this kind of behaviour. Unfortunately, not many of them are capable of speaking to people on earth, so it's going to, you know, take a bit of examination. But you, you're not, you also got to measure that as the potential outcome of your choices and decisions. You follow me? And what I see is the majority of people do not wish to m analyse all of that and examine whether that is pain or pleasure. Does that make sense? They're only willing to examine the particular moment in time that they've got an offer of getting an addiction met. That's all they're examining. Right? The problem with only examining a moment in time is that you're not accurately examining anything really. And to accurately examine everything, you're going to have to examine the lives of other people who have passed, who, who have passed with this particular issue on earth. Uh, you're also going to have to have a good forward look into your future and ask yourself, you know, imagine yourself being 80 years of age or something and, and living this life. Is that going to be able to be, like, is that ever going to happen? even you need to examine these particular questions if you're truly going to be honest with yourself about the current results you follow what i'm saying yeah yeah yep. and this is what you're refusing to do because yeah. your only focus is on the instant gratification of meeting an addiction does that make sense yeah and as a result of that you're not analyzing anything over a longer period of time what the long-term effects are the long-term effects on your soul are the long-term effects on other people's soul the the long-term effects on your body you're going to be in and so forth you're not e examining any of these issues okay yep thank you yep so this is what requires like uh, my feelings more honest self-examination as to the long-term effects of this course of behavior is the way to go Yep. And then notwithstanding the fact that when you meet your soulmate, who is a woman, right? Your soulmate's a woman? Yeah, I'm assuming so. That's my well, attraction. Well, that's your that's attraction, woman, yeah. isn't it? So, so when you meet her mm -hmm. and she finds out about all of these things you've done, mm -hmm. how's she going to also feel about these things? And also once she's sensitive emotionally, how's she even going to feel during this period of time? So at the moment, complete rejection from you. You're completely rejecting your soulmate. Right? So she's going to have to process her way through that also. So there's not only the consequences on your own life, but also the consequences with regard to the other half of your soul and on their life too. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, you know, what I see is the majority of people on earth are not honestly examining they're what's really going on they're just they're just in the moment of pleasure it's a there's a bible saying for it it's an epi epicurean lifestyle and the epicureans were people of, of old you know in the in the first century around about in the in the in the first 100 years or so and they they had a philosophy of life which is very similar to today's philosophy eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we will die 
or may die. So what they, they were interested in doing was extracting every ounce of so-called instant gratification pleasure out of their life until they died, assuming that their death would be the end of it. So I would also suggest to you that you probably don't have much of an idea or concept about afterlife at this stage, and you certainly aren't considering it in your choices and decisions. Every one of those people who had that concept are still in the hells today. 2,000 years later. So that tells you the seriousness of such decisions. Remember I said that you make a decision, just a little decision to do uh, a sin, you think it's not so bad, but it does engage you to the next sin. And the no, next I'm sin. Noticing that a lot. Yeah. And the next sin. And the next sin. And each time you're basically desensitizing your soul to sin. Right? And this is the process you're engaged in. And, and if you keep desensitizing your soul to sin, by the time you stop, if you do stop even, you'll be so far gone that it's going to be very, very hard to recover yourself from sin. You see? So my suggestion is to have a good reflection about where your life's headed and, and ask yourself, is the momentary pleasure worth these long-term painful results? Because that's where, where you're headed. Long-term painful results. Yeah, that's big. Yeah. So the key is to allow yourself to feel about that. Yep. Good eye. Okay, was that a bit heavy for you? <laughs> many, many do this. Like many are just considering the short-term momentary satisfaction of an addiction rather than considering the long-term effects of these kind of choices both on yourself and other people around you and then also considering what may ha if there is an afterlife so you need to at least ask yourself that question if there is one where do you think you're going to end up there as well uh, so all very important questions to ask oneself and a person who's truly self-reflective does do that if we go to sandra thanks and this will be our last question sandra thank you so you've already told me that in the last assistance group as well that I'm going to be in the hells and I'm going to be there for hundreds of years. And I, I've I didn't say you were going to be. No, I, I said know. if you continue, yes. there, was a, there was a big if in there, wasn't That's there? That's true. <laughs> yes. and so let's accurately state it. If you continue to, to choose to exorcise your, your rage with men towards men, as you have been doing, then yes, it's going to not work out well for you. So I've done, I went home mm -hmm. and it took me about a year, maybe longer probably, yeah. to go, okay, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I could, at moments I even felt like, wow, I can actually feel that, I can see it. Now I'm seeing it in my body and I'm still doing it. Like yeah. Maybe not so much directly with men right now, but I'm seeing it with everybody constantly, all the time. Yeah, you're taking out a lot of anger with yeah. people all the time, so it is an issue, isn't it? Yeah, like I can feel my whole body's always... I'm actually angry in my body, like, the whole time I live, almost, from the moment I wake up. It's like this constant... So, wh so what you need to firstly have is an, uh, is an aspiration to actually feel anger without dumping it on other people mm -hmm. so that there's a first aspiration that needs to be developed and then the second aspiration is to find out what you're so terrified of that causes you to get so angry mm. does that make sense yeah. you need to find that that and again an aspiration needs to be developed to do that from within yourself no one else can make you do it you know, we've done things like remove you from different things or, or you know, when you've done, been an unloving person or, you know, we've encouraged the guys, you know, with the forum to remove you from the forum if you're going to be unloving on the forum and so forth. But, it, but if that's not enough to go, cause you to pause and then to allow yourself to work your way through the feelings, then I suggest there's not going to be a lot to motivate you otherwise. So, so my suggestion is, number one, develop the aspiration to never project anger at another person and to feel it inside of yourself instead. To feel, go, and if that means you need to even create a room at home, <laughs> you know, that is like a soundproof room where you can yell, scream, punch, whatever you need to do to, to exorcise, you know, get rid of some of this anger. 
The second thing is though, there needs to be a will to feel the fear that's under the anger. You're obviously there's a strong fear that's there and you're justifying this fear to yourself constantly, right? So you need to be willing to find it, willing to discover it, willing to see it, find out. It's this fear that's causing a lot of havoc in your life. You follow it? Yeah, and I like so like on the reflection of yesterday's homework, it's like I live in that fear constantly, in the panic almost. No, you and don't. And I choose to f no. No, but you live in the prevention it. of it. Yeah, and so then I use. The you don't even to feel the fear. You, you're too fast preventing it mm. to even feel it. You follow me? Yeah. So you there's a demand constantly coming at everybody. Save me! Save me! Save, save me from a fear! God save me from a fear! And to God as well, and yeah. Yep, exactly. So I can feel that as a truth. I felt that as a truth, but I'm still doing it, and this is the problem. Yeah. So, uh, so now you need to work on your will to feel fear. Mm. Your will to actually feel the emotion of fear rather than acting upon it or rather than living it or trying to prevent it. So at the moment, you've got a very strong desire to prevent the feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, many of you women fall in the same category. Very strong desire to prevent the feeling of fear. It needs to change. Does that make sense? And that, that requires you developing your will to change it so that you want to feel your fear rather than have other people make your fear go away. Mm -hmm. All right? So it's an intense addiction projected at other people in order for you to avoid the feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. So you know that. So now what you need to do is develop an aspiration to feel fear. Okay. All right? mm -hmm. yeah, if you don't do that, of course, the if will occur. <laughs> yep. But, but if you do, the if will disappear, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so it's just, just a matter of you working through the issue enough to want to um, address, address the fear rather than preventing the fear all the time. So your addiction is to preventing the experience of fear. Mm -hmm. okay. That's your addiction. So, so you, you're desperate for it. It's like a compulsion, you're isn't it? Frenzy, like yeah, you're in frenzy I'll do mode. Anything. Yeah, yeah. you do anything to yeah. do it. Yeah. So, so that's going to mean now you're developing a desire, an aspiration within yourself that comes from yourself, where you can see the problems. So you're already seeing the problems, you, mm. you, you know. And the more we act in harmony with love with you, the more you'll see the problem. Or you could run away, but you, mm. mostly now you're starting to say, yes, you know, I'm going to get removed from something if I'm unloving. <laughs> before, you could, you, before the feeling in you was almost like, if I'm unloving, everyone should put up with it. Yeah, like I just, yeah. <coughs> demand that I should be, like almost like... I should be able to get away with it. Word, um, where you... The, yeah, the feeling I... Entitled to being a bitch, basically. Yes, yeah. the feeling I have from you is, my fear means that I should get away with it. Mm. Right, that's how you feel. My fear means I should get away with it. And the more we treat you lovingly, the more we'll not let you get away with it. Thank right? you. <laughs> Which is good for you. Yeah. But, but the reality is an aspiration needs to develop to feel the fear rather than having this big motion on top of the fear, which is because I'm afraid I should be able to get away with any behaviour. Mm. Hmm. This is the attitude that causes war, my dear sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the relationship yep. now, like after all of you spoken about to us. So. Yep. Yeah. Great. Yes. And many women have it. Mm -hmm. Many women have it. You're very, very afraid for your personal safety, personal welfare, personal security, um, uh, physical security, sexual security, emotional security, and 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 also economic security. Um, but I live kind of in rebellion of that fear by actually exposing myself to it. Like not like I don't have a re like a lock on the but door. But this is how illogical like that, we so are. The, yeah. the law of attraction is working perfectly, of course. Yeah. So it's going to expose these fears all the time. It's going to drive you nuts. Mm, right. <laughs> mm. God's so nice like that. I'm living in denial of that I'm afraid totally because I'm like living, you know, I don't lock my car, I don't do this, I put myself in situations all my life. Yeah, like which are unsafe and dangerous. And I didn't even notice it. Exactly. I thought yeah. I wasn't afraid, that's what I thought. Yeah, no. Wow, shit. But, but, but look how you're willing to treat men. Mm. When and you're women as well. And women when yeah. you're afraid, yeah, yeah. pretty intense, right? Yeah. 
Okay. So Thank obviously you. you are afraid. Yeah. So at least you, at least there's a growing awareness. Mm -hmm. So that's a positive thing. And at least there's also a feeling inside of you now developing where you feel like, well, you know, I've probably got to do something about this. So that's a good thing. So there's the aspiration building, but, but the aspiration to actually feel the terror is not Zero there yet. <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Which is why you revert to the anger each time, even though you have these awarenesses developing. Yeah. Mm. And you also mentioned to Monique um, in the... Um, you know, her feedback, you know, how you've done all these other yep. feedbacks and it was all about um, how spirits, which I know totally 100% sure I can feel when it's when they're hooking into everything that Of course they're going to hook into all this. So you said that when this happens, the terror will come up so much because the spirits will get really, really angry at us. So I suppose I'm so terrified of that that I want to be in this codependent addiction with them no matter what. Yeah. Because I'm afraid of the attack. Well, you're happy with it. Yeah. You're happy with I it at it. this stage, yeah. yeah. At this stage, you're happy to dump a whole little bit of crap on men yeah. and they're happy to use yeah. you to do it as well. So you're in agreement with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Thank you so no much worries, for that. No worries, Sandra. Okay, well, that brings us to the conclusion today. Um, interesting discussion, huh? Pain, pleasure and will. It's just interesting... All right. Well, tomorrow morning, we uh, basically, basically there's uh, four presentations tomorrow. In the morning, there'll be a presentation about actually developing your will to love, which is our main concept of the entire, of the entire week. And then we will be looking at, we'll give you a Q&A uh, with that subject. And then we'll be looking at the rewards of developing your will and how to use your will in the world uh, as well. So that's our main topics for tomorrow. Thanks for your time again today. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you receive some benefit from it. Hopefully there's been some inspiration to develop your aspiration. <laughs> Have a good night, hey? Thank you. Yeah.